All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to guess that people are starting to join. So we will give a minute or two for people to log in. I see the participant numbers going up here. Hope everybody's coming on. Dr. Lake Bakar, are you okay if I give one more minute? Yeah, it's fine. Get everybody situated. Perfect. Um, for those of you just logging in, if you hopefully have experienced a, a great muzzle webinar before, you'll know that at the bottom, I think it's on the bottom of my screen, but um, basically there's a question and answer little box there. And so as we go along, if you have questions or wanna share something, please feel free to put it in that box. We'll try to keep checking it as Dr. Lake Bakar goes through her webinar. And then uh, hopefully we can have some time at the end to answer some of your, your questions. Cause that's the most, I think sometimes the, the most fun part of seeing what everybody is interested in. So give it just another minute here and then we'll get started. Okay. All right. I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and um, get going here, but uh, thank you everybody for joining us on this wonderful March day. At least it's, it's nice and sunny here in Colorado. And so I uh, hope everybody had a great St. Patrick's Day as well. My name is uh, Ashley Ackley and I am a veterinarian in Denver and I'm on the board of directors for the Grand Muzzle Organization. Um, and Dr. Lake Bakar is wonderful cardiologist in, in Denver as well. And before we get to her talk, I'm so excited to have her. Um, I just wanted to do a few updates for Gray Muzzle. Um, if this is the first time you're with us or you don't know who we are, um, we are the largest national nonprofit organization um, focused specifically on the well-being of senior dogs. And so we save and improve the lives of at-risk senior dogs by providing resources and uh, to animal welfare groups um, nationwide. And so on top of the fundraising and the education, the webinars such as this, um, we do grants and that's how we um, give out funding for um, different shelters and rescues. And so the absolute most important thing that we do here at Gray Muzzle, and I just wanted to touch on it a little bit because we're in full swing for another grant season. Um, the grant applications, I think they close today and um, Amanda, which is, who is one of our amazing Gray Muzzle staff, will we'll start to divide out those grants to our volunteer reviewers. Um, and the, I would say that the training and the hours spent coordinating this and reviewing and re-reviewing and scoring um, is, is really intense. And so thanks to anybody who has ever done grant review before. Um, we really, really, really appreciate it. And um, if you're interested in it next year, keep your eyes out. Um, I think at the end of the year, we usually send out something or maybe the beginning of the year asking for, for volunteer grant reviewers. And so you need no special training um, or profession, you know, you don't need to be in a certain profession to do this. Um, it just really helps to have diverse reviewers. Um, and I think that it's a really, really fun thing to give back um, to Gray Muzzle. So if you're interested um, next year, keep an eye on that. So, um, you know, we gave out almost $850,000 last year and to 90 organizations, I think we had over 300 applications. And so we're hoping to give out more this year. Um, I think we'll, we'll see, depends on the number of grant, um, grant applications and finances. Um, but dare I say, I think we're, we're crossing our fingers. Maybe we can reach that million mark. So only time will tell. Um, again, a few housekeeping. If you have any questions, please type them in the question and answer box at the bottom and I'll try to get to them at the end. And um, again, this, this topic and this um, wonderful veterinarian are very near and dear to my heart. So I'll let her introduce herself. Um, but uh, thanks again for being here, Dr. Lake Bakar. Take welcome. it away. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I am Dr. Jerry Lake Bacar. Um, I'm a veterinary cardiologist and I own Evolution Veterinary Specialists in Lakewood. Um, we are a privately owned uh, veterinary hospital. Um, we have cardiology, obviously, critical care, 
um, oncology, anesthesia, exotic surgery, internal medicine. Um, and we see a lot of, I would say the vast majority of my clientele are older patients. Um, and so we're going to talk about one of the most common types of heart disease we'll see in them. And just um, from a perspective of an owner, um, what to look for and what your options are. So again, we're going to start with signs of mitral valve disease um, and then go ahead with a discussion of some of the diagnostic tools at your, dispo at your disposal, um, treatment options, a bit of prognosis, and then we'll briefly touch on general anesthesia in patients with heart disease. So mitral valve disease is going to be one of the most common forms of heart disease that we see in small and medium-sized dogs, and it's going to be one of the most common acquired diseases that we see in older dogs. And so uh, rather than focus on every type of heart disease, I thought it would be better just to focus on mitral valve disease because this is going to be the majority of what we see in our older dogs. Um, other diseases less commonly are going to be dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, we can see dietary-associated cardiomyopathy, and then we do see a small percentage of dogs um, that have congenital heart disease that was undiagnosed. Um, but again, for the most part, in, in older dogs that have been in the household um, and a murmur gets detected, this is what we're going to be diagnosing. So of the cases that I see, about 40% or so of them will end up on some type of medication. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that only about 10% of dogs are going to develop heart failure. Um, a big part of that is that we are catching heart disease a lot sooner now. Um, and then also in general, heart disease is going to be relatively slowly progressive. So most dogs are not going to spontaneously develop, develop heart failure or, um, you know, unless there's like some other intervening event, like a general anesthetic event or something like that. So the first sign that you're probably going to see of heart disease in your dog is at a veterinary exam, where your veterinarian as part of your general exam is going to do an auscultation. And so that's when they're taking a stethoscope and listening to your dog's chest. And then they're going to talk to you about murmurs. And so it is a good idea to have a general concept of heart murmurs, um, with one being very, very soft, and then a grade six being as loud as it can get. Um, and you can actually hear that murmur without a stethoscope. A common misconception, though, is that the murmur intensity correlates to severity of disease. So people will often be very, very nervous that their dog has a grade four murmur. Um, and a lot of people will think, oh, well, grade four is four times as bad as a grade one. And that's not necessarily what it means. Um, however, if you do have a pup that has a murmur and say it's a grade two, um, and then the next year it's a grade three, and then the next year it's a grade four, that's going to be a dog that um, likely is having progressive heart disease. Other things to keep in mind as well is that auscultation is a little bit subjective as well. So um, it's actually pretty common that, um, you know, the murmur, there's concern it got louder, the concern the murmur changed. And it is pretty important um, to not get too worried if you have different people listening and one person's grading it as a two and one person's grading it as a three. In general, cardiologists will um, grade murmured relatively similarly, but certainly I've also seen cases where I grade a little bit differently than the other cardiologists. So again, this is probably going to be your first sign of heart disease. Um, it is going to be indicative that there is something going on, um, but from there, you really need to have some additional testing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the signs of heart disease. Um, so like I mentioned, most dogs um, are not actually going to be showing any signs of heart disease. So um, we're going to grade that heart murmur. Um, and the murmur actually is going to correlate in with mitral regurgitation um, with that valve that's not working properly. And so when you have a valve that's leaking, um, you're going to hear that turbulent blood flow, and that's what causes your murmur. But otherwise, the heart generally is going to compensate quite well until we get to signs of more severe disease. And so signs of more disease are typically going to be respiratory in nature. Um, so most commonly, we're going to see a cough that's progressive. Um, and then sometimes we can see increased respiratory rate and effort. Um, other signs are actually not super common. So things like episodic exercise intolerance or purple gums or white gums or um, other major um, physical findings actually typically aren't due to heart disease. There's usually something else going on um, versus if we're seeing those respiratory signs, that's kind of the first thing I think of. 
Um, like I mentioned as well, for the majority of dogs, there's not going to be any signs at all. And then we can certainly um, see in the more severe cases, though, um, where patients are collapsing with exertion, and that's called syncope. So um, typical syncopal type episode is going to be a dog running up the stairs or um, an owner coming home and the dog getting really excited, um, running around, passing out, then popping right back up again. So let's talk a little bit about diagnostic tools. So now you've gone to your veterinarian and they've heard a heart murmur, what are the next options that we have? So in terms of assessing um, for kind of more urgent types of disease, sleeping respiratory rate monitoring is actually a really great tool to use at home. Um, it's free and it's easy to do um, and easy to track. And so basically what you wanna do is when your pet's sleeping or resting very soundly, you're gonna count the number of times the chest goes up and down over 15 seconds, multiply by that by four, and that's gonna be your breaths per minute. This is something that I strongly recommend um, any patient that has significant heart disease, this gets monitored, but it's also a good way too to help differentiate if there's coughing or something else going on. Um, is this something where we need to go to the cardiologist or should we be looking at other causes? So in terms of when to be concerned, so a sleeping respiratory rate of less than 30 breaths per minute is normal. So if you have a pup that starts coughing, uh, but you're consistently seeing that respiratory rate less than 30 breaths per minute, that cough is probably due to something else besides heart disease. Mild elevations are going to be more like 40 to 50 breaths per minute. And again, this is when the patient is sleeping. So a lot of times I'll get clients call in and they'll say, oh, you know, he was running around and now his respiratory rate's 50. So that's normal. Um, the reason why we like a sleeping respiratory rate is they are not stimulated by their environment um, and we can get a pretty accurate assessment. So if you are, if your dog has been diagnosed with having a heart murmur um, and you're noticing those signs, um, definitely you want to get seen pretty quickly. And then if that respiratory rate is greater than 50 breaths per minute, or there's other signs like we talked about, like collapse or um, you know other you know really severe coughing, then that's actually something that I wouldn't recommend waiting and I'd go to an ER right away. So one of the most common tests that are going to be done at an, a vet, so this can either be done at your vet clinic, at an ER clinic, or um, if a patient is coming to me for evaluation of x-rays. And so with our x-rays, we can assess the heart size, uh, we can assess the blood vessels, and we can look for the presence or absence of fluid. So when we're looking at chest x-rays, um, they still aren't 100%. And so certainly if you have a dog that has a big heart on x-rays, that's going to make us more worried about heart disease. And if the heart looks totally normal, then we're less worried about heart disease. But unfortunately, I would say that's probably only about 10% of our cases. And the rest of the time, maybe the heart's a little bit big, maybe there are some changes, um, but x-rays are definitely not a always a definitive. Um, the other thing we're looking for is um, evidence of heart failure. And so that's when we're starting to build up fluid from the, in the lungs because the heart's no longer functioning properly. And so we're looking for increased whiteness in the lungs, which is indicative of fluid. Now, the other hard part is that increased whiteness in the lungs can also be due to radiographic technique. It can be due to inflammation, um, and it can also be due to infection. So again, if we're seeing that, um, the x-rays still aren't 100% in terms of differentiating heart failure um, from other things. Another test that has um, become available in-house is actually an, an NT Pro BMP. Um, what's nice about this test is it's um, available through um, a company called BioNote, and this can actually be run in-house, and it's relatively inexpensive as well. So what's really nice about having an in-house BMP is if you can take x-rays and you're like, well, the heart's kind of big, um, but I'm not really sure, you know, is this something I need to be sending to a cardiologist quickly? Um, how worried should we be? Um, this test can help um, your veterinarian make a little bit more of an assessment of how much to worry about the heart disease. So what BMP measures is essentially how well is the heart handling the heart disease? So how much is the heart straining? How much is the heart muscle straining? And so um, if that number is low, then the likelihood of heart failure is almost zero. And so again, um, the most common thing we're looking for is coughing or um, sometimes too, we're also just trying to stage our heart disease. And so this is a way that 
that we can assess, okay, everything's normal, we don't have to worry too much, versus if those numbers get in the 2000s or higher, that's when we really start worrying as well. And so it is always a hard decision to make in terms of when to get a murmur worked up. Um, it's never wrong to get it worked up immediately, um, but if we're trying to assess um, stress to the patient, cost, and all of those things, um, certainly things to worry about are, um, most importantly, if there are signs present, like collapsing or difficulty breathing or coughing. So those are kind of the ones where absolutely you need to have a workup. Um, and then the other would be a relatively loud murmur because typically, um, even though, like I said earlier, grade four isn't necessarily four times as bad, you're much more likely to have more significant disease with a loud murmur. The other concern too would be a murmur that has been getting progressively louder over time, because then we're also worried about um, that murmur getting, you know, that heart disease getting worse. And then that last is going to be if we have a general anesthetic coming up as well, because um, getting further workup and echo of our heart disease enables us to better assess anesthetic risk, um, which typically we're not going to say you can't do anesthesia, um, but it also helps us make some changes to our anesthetic protocol to make that anesthesia a little bit safer. So lastly, um, echocardiography um, is going to be, um, you know, I might be a little bit biased, but probably our most important tool that we can use. Um, tricky part about this, though, is it does require a cardiologist. So um, these aren't tests typically that your vet can do in-house. Now, um, I and, you know, lots of other cardiologists will do um, sometimes, you know, mobile echoes. Um, we offer at our clinic something called an outpatient echo where um, you guys do the traveling, um, but we're able to keep the cost down, especially for those pre-anesthetic cases. Um, and then I generally prefer doing um, full consultations in my office. Um, primary reason for that is I have all of my materials with me. Um, if we see something unexpected, we have the ability to make those adjustments. And then Overall, I feel like when people get to talk to the cardiologist, they have a little bit better understanding of the heart disease and what the treatment options are. So the difference between x-rays and an echocardiogram is that the x-rays really show us a shadow of the heart. And so we're seeing, um, you know, that silhouette of the heart um, and we can look at the lungs quite well. Um, one of the hard things, though, is that the x-ray doesn't show us anything about the function of the heart. And then also it's tricky because some dogs with different um, chest conformations or, or a little bit on the heavier side, their hearts can actually look big um, and then they end up being normal size on echo. And so, again, when we're looking at silhouettes, there, it, there's a lot that can be interpreted. Um, certainly, diagnosing severe heart disease is a bit easier, but those nuances between normal and mildly enlarged and sometimes even moderate disease can be really tricky. So our echo actually enables to us to look at all the chambers of the heart and measure the pressures in the heart. Um, and so then we can actually grade and measure that heart disease. And then we also um, are just able to track changes, track changes in function, look for fluid, that kind of thing. Um, it does not determine the presence or absence of heart failure, though. So commonly, um, when people are looking to rule out heart failure, they'll, they'll um, want an echo. Now, certainly, it significantly helps us make that assessment, because if the heart disease is severe, then heart failure is much like, more likely, and if the heart disease is mild, less likely. Um, but we still need chest x-rays, signs of heart failure, that kind of thing, to make that definitive diagnosis. So another test that we may end up recommending is called an electrocardiogram. So difference between the electrocardiogram and the echocardiogram is the electrocardiogram assesses the heart rhythm and the electrical conduction through the heart versus the echocardiogram is the ultrasound we just talked about that looks at the heart structure and function. So different reasons we might be doing that are um, if we hear an irregular heart rhythm on our exam. Um, frequently in our older dogs too, um, we may just hear some irregular heartbeats. Um, typically, those are gonna be what we call premature ventricular beats that come from the pumping chambers. Um, or it's kind of like a pre-anesthetic screen and something pops up on there as well. And so, the irregular heart rhythms can sometimes be trickier in our older dogs as well, just because they can also be caused by other underlying diseases. So things like pain, um, stomach disease, lung disease can also cause irregular heart rhythms. And so also important to note that um, sometimes you may end up coming in and getting a workup and there's actually still another underlying disease happening. 
If we do that electrocardiogram, though, and we do think there's a significant heart issue present, um, or we have concerns about anesthesia, we can then also run what's called a Holter monitor, which is a 24-hour EKG, and that enables us to assess the heart rhythm um, when your pup is walking or eating or sleeping. So now we've diagnosed our heart disease, what treatment options do we have? So first we're kind of starting with um, outpatient versus inpatient. So outpatient is gonna be the vast majority of patients that we see. So those are gonna be the patients that have um, either mild, like either no signs at all. So we're working them up for um, an anesthesia or just we a heart murmur heard in the exam um, or have very mild signs versus inpatient are gonna be that small percentage of dogs that have developed congestive heart failure and clinical signs. And where we make that differentiate between um, clinical signs and needing to be hospitalized is primarily going to be the severity of disease and severity of the signs. Big difference is that in hospital, we can provide oxygen support. So with severe disease, those hearts are really having a hard time and being able to support them with more oxygen is helpful. Um, also being able to help the breathing with that ox oxygen support as well. Then the other thing is that most of the time um, with heart failure, it has been progressing over time. And so we have that ability of 24-hour nursing care where if um, you know the, your, your dog starts doing worse, um, we're able to titrate therapy. And also if they're doing better, they don't get too much therapy. Another really big component of inpatient therapy is being able to give intravenous or IV medications. Again, the benefit of that is going to be able to be titrating the medication. So if the patient's doing better, we can slow down the IVs. If the patient's doing worse, we can give more. And then also it's really important because those medications get into the system that much quicker. And then lastly, whenever we're giving a bunch of medications, we're typically going to want to monitor function of the organs that are um, having to process those medications. And so being able to do follow-up testing is important. On the flip side, and again, what most people are going to experience, outpatient, we're going to talk more about what preventative medications can we start, um, how can we potentially stabilize out the heart disease, and then if there are any signs, how to detect those and how to monitor them. So most heart disease, again, is subclinical. And so the primary monitoring is going to be monitoring those sleeping respiratory rates like we talked about. And then based on the echo and uh, what our concerns are, we may start additional medications. So the primary medication that most cardiologists prescribe is called vetmedin or pemobendin. This is a medication that really has changed treatment of heart disease. And so in most patients, it's going to improve the heart function. So that's called a positive inotrope. So essentially it helps the heart contract better. And so it's gonna improve the heart function. Um, in dogs that have severe disease, it actually will slow down the time of onset of heart failure compared to patients that are not on vetmedin. And then also within about a month of taking the medications, and these are typically going to be our mild or moderate dogs, we're going to see a significant reduction in heart size as well. So um, this medication not only stabilizes out the heart, it can actually sometimes reverse some of the heart disease. And then in general, we do find as well that it improves how the patient is feeling as well, especially in patients with more severe heart disease. So the other medications we use are um, gain our are more focused on um, managing the body's response to heart disease. So as the heart gets bigger, it starts to stimulate the stress systems of the body, and that's called the renin angiotestinal aldosterone system. So that's also known as the RAS system. And so how the body responds to stress is we're thinking of very extreme scenarios where you're, um, ha you know, you've been attacked by a lion and you're bleeding everywhere and your body is trying to control your blood pressure control um, flow to your important organs. And so your body is mimicking that by increasing blood pressure. Um, to do that, it's going to decrease vessel size. Also, it's going to improve, it's going to promote sodium intake. And then with sodium takes water. Um, and then also things like it, increasing stress activities or your sympathetic activity. So although this is an important mechanism for keeping the body safe in life or death situations, for heart disease, increasing the volume the heart has to deal with, increasing the pressure the heart has to pump against, um, and increasing how much work the heart does is actually detrimental. 
So there are a couple medications we can use, which are called RAS inhibitors. So those are going to be the medications that inhibit that response of the systems. And so the two most common are going to be minazapril and nalapril, as well as spironolactone. So essentially what these medications do is they decrease the, the strain and stress on the heart. Commonly people will ask me because um, sometimes minazapril and nalapril can be used for high blood pressure, um, but that's not why we use it for heart disease. We're using it more to mitigate those responses of excessive sodium retention um, and, and the detrimental effects that we see um, when, we're, when the heart is trying to manage disease. When we're treating our patients in hospital, um, we're looking at using um, most, most hospitals will have this kind of specialized oxygen unit called a Snyder oxygen kennel. Um, so this actually enables us to monitor both the oxygen and the carbon dioxide levels. Um, we can change the temperature, we can change the humidity, and then we can also give IV medications and titrate treatment to how our patient is doing and what the patient is needing. And then also importantly as well, we're going to be monitoring our blood work, making sure that the um, that the body is handling things well. Um, just a quick note too. So, as a pet owner, because um, one of the most common questions is, are there side effects to the medication? So, vet med in general is not going to cause side effects, um, other than in maybe some improvement in energy. Um, in rare cases, I can see it caused some stomach upset and diarrhea. That's usually going to be dogs that. Um, are sensitive to medications already. Um, but in general, even though the package insert has a good 5,000 different side effects, it seems like um, I really don't see any of those. In terms of our RAS inhibition medications, those are ones where we do have to monitor the body systems a little bit more closely um, because they can actually impact the kidney function. And so monitoring kidney blood work is going to be important. Um, in some cases with the benazapril and enalapril, we can see decreased appetite. Um, and so that's something that we need to keep an eye on as well. And then spironolactone generally doesn't cause increased drinking or urination, but it is something to kind of keep an eye out for. So prognosis. So this is probably also a question that um, I get asked quite a lot is what is the prognosis? So for most mild heart disease, it's going to be slowly progressive and it's not going to impact life expectancy. Um, most of those dogs, again, at some point might need to be on some medication. But if we're diagnosing mild heart disease in a 10, 11, 12 year old dog, likelihood of that being a life limiting disease unless they um, are Particular types of breeds, so like Cavalier or King Charles, are definitely very prone to progressive heart disease. In general, this is not going to be life or death, um, and it's going to be something more that's managed. For the patients that do develop congestive heart failure, so that's, again, going to be our severe um, disease that we're now building up fluid, the prognosis is about a year and a half to two and a half years following first onset of congestive heart failure. So that is when a cardiologist is managing the case. So in general, um, the prognosis is about 40% longer with a cardiologist managing the case. Um, one of those reasons is just that we tend to have all of those tools like BNP and all the testing there. We have the echo that we can get done it right away. We're able to make adjustments that much faster. And then also um, just when all you do is treat heart disease all day long, those little subtle things um, are a little bit easier to pick up. So then general anesthesia. So um, you know, one of the big things we need to decide is, you know, when are we going to do general anesthesia for our patients? When is heart disease too severe to do general anesthesia? Um, and what can we do to mitigate this? So for the most part, mild heart disease is going to be relatively low risk. Um, biggest things that we're going to need to do are just be careful of um, fluid overload. So being careful of the amount of fluids the patient is getting um, and otherwise more just monitoring other, other disease states. But mild disease, you're generally fine. Moderate heart disease um, is requires a little bit more monitoring, but usually still um, anesthesia is going to be doable. Um, and in general, it's pretty unlikely that anesthesia just is going to cause a severe outcome where the patient just dies unexpectedly, it's more likely that we push that patient into heart failure. So um, in the moderate diseases or severe diseases, um, those are the, um, the severe cases are where generally at a certain point, I'm going to be starting to talk about avoiding anesthesia for what we call elective procedures. So um, say we have a dog that's been getting dentals every year and their teeth are doing pretty well, um, but we're now in those phases of having really significant heart 
disease, we do need to make that balance between the risk of pushing that patient into heart failure um, versus kind of preventative care. And so um, since that prognosis, if the patient is in heart failure is about a year and a half to two and a half years, kind of taking into account where are the teeth at, um, you know, is this something that we avoid? Uh, we still can do anesthesia on severe patients and congestive heart patients. And um, much to our anesthesiologist's chagrin, we do it quite often, especially because of my patient load. Um, and it's doable, it just is higher risk. And again, pretty unlikely that you're going to have a severe anesthetic event where the patient doesn't make it through anesthesia, but it's more um, the after anesthesia, making sure that the lungs haven't built up with fluid, that the heart is still doing okay, um, and that the other organs um, that are helping support the heart, like the kidneys, um, you know, aren't having any complications either. So that kind of brings me to the end of this talk, because um, I was kind of expecting that there might be quite a few questions. Um, so I will yeah. turn it over to Ashley to see if there's any questions for me, and we can go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Lake Bacar. That was great. Um, I do have some questions coming in, and certainly um, if you have more, there's a question and answer. That's probably the easiest place for me to find them, and we have some going in the chat. Um, but the, the first one you kind of just briefly touched on, but someone asked, are there pre breeds that are more predisposed to heart disease? So I think oh, yeah. you could chat a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah. So that's a great question. So there definitely are breeds that are predisposed. So in general, smaller breed dogs are going to be more likely to develop mitral valve disease than your larger dogs. Um, and then within those smaller breed dogs, Cavalier King Charles are going to be the poster child for heart disease. So um, there are some studies that show that Cavalier Actually, it happens in like a hundred, like heart disease happens in a hundred percent of cavaliers. I certainly have seen um, a couple cavaliers that don't have heart disease. One is actually a veterinarian's dog, and she always like brings her dog in, and she's like, "There's no murmur, still, right?" And so, um, her dog is definitely um, one of the few cavaliers I have met that doesn't have any heart disease. Um, and then other common breeds we're going to see are um, breeds like Chihuahuas and um, Shelties, Boston Terriers. Those, those little dogs, um, definitely heart disease is much more common. And um, someone brought up a different question, but uh, brought up Dobies. And I know we're talking about a type of, of heart disease, yes. mitral valve disease today, but are there other breeds that are predisposed to other types of heart disease? Yes. Yeah. So that's also a good question. So um, I kind of purposely left out dilated cardiomyopathy because I didn't think I'd have time to do both. Um, but there certainly are breeds of dogs that are very prone to dilated cardiomyopathy, which is where um, the heart function is decreased. So Dobermans are kind of the poster child for that disease. And they also get very significant arrhythmias as well. So um, their disease can be very rapidly progressive. Um, the prognosis is a lot poorer. So typically from the time of detection of abnormal heart function um, to sudden death is sometimes anywhere short of six to nine months. Um, the other breed that we can see um, abnormal heart rhythms and sometimes dilated cardiomyopathy is boxers. So boxers are another one where we see quite a lot of heart disease. And then any of your giant breed dogs are going to be prone to dilated cardiomyopathy. So that's going to be your um, Irish wolfhounds, Great Danes, those sorts of breeds. And then the last um, category, which is a newer category, is dietary associated heart disease. Um, and that's going to be dogs that are being fed um, diets that are high in peas, lentils, and potatoes. Um, and they're your kind of general boutique diets. And that can actually impact any dogs from puppies to older dogs. Um, we don't see as many older dogs just because um, typically they're going to present with heart disease earlier. Um, but certainly I have seen older dogs that were switched to um, one of these boutique diets and then developed um, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy from that. Um, this question was um, about flying, actually, which I, I thought was interesting. So um, questions regarding flying animals with known heart disease. They have approximately 6,000 pilot volunteers nationally with pilots and paws. So that's great. Thanks for, for doing what you do. The, um, the majority of the time, they do not know the rescue animal's history. We do recommend a slow ascent and descent, but the majority of these planes are not pressurized. Any um, additional suggestions or advice for um, their pilot specifically, but I also think that kind of leads into just flying your, your mm -hmm. pets with heart disease in general. Yeah. So 
Yeah. yeah, so that's a good question too. So um, essentially flying is like, um, you know, going to super high altitude. And so in Colorado, we're kind of used to it, but especially patients um, coming from sea level, um, the biggest disease I worry about is pulmonary hypertension, um, because as your altitude goes up, your oxygen content goes down. And so pulmonary hypertension, the patients don't, um, they don't assimilate oxygen as well. So that's where we can generally see concerns. Um, otherwise, your typical dog with with heart disease, like mitral valve disease, even if it's severe, and even if it's managed heart failure, should generally do okay from the flying perspective. Um, the concern is more like stress and like if they're kind of on the brink of heart failure and then the flying event is super stressful and then they're at higher altitude and there's less oxygen, um, that can kind of have a spiraling effect. But in terms of slow ascent and descent, um, I don't, necessarily think it would impact the only place it would impact is like you know if you had the option of turning back around which you don't and seeing if a patient was having a problem but clinically i think if they're going to have an issue at high altitude they will whether it's a slow ascent or descent um, and then again the majority of dogs should do fine great yeah that's a that's a good one and that's a question i get a lot too mm -hmm. um, about flying so this kind of goes into it which you kind of touched on too but does living at high altitude um predispose and contribute to um, seniors with heart problems. Yes, it does. Um, so when I used to practice at sea level, so I used to practice in California, and I see so many more patients with respiratory issues now. And so the biggest thing at high altitude, again, is that um, their body's response to low oxygen, which is what happens at high altitude, is increasing the pressure in the lungs. And so that's called pulmonary hypertension. So if you have patients that at sea level have, say, moderate pulmonary hypertension, you can frequently bring them up to high altitude, and then we'll see them decompensate. Um, so, so whereas at sea level, I treated pulmonary hypertension, which is technically a lung issue, but um, is um, does impact the heart. Um, I rarely saw it at um, in altitude. I probably see as much heart failure as I do pulmonary hypertension. Um, it also then increases complications with heart failure because um, you can actually have have both heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. So we tend to manage that quite a lot. And then it also impacts the diagnosis because um, pulmonary hypertension will make the heart look big. It will make strange changes to the lungs. And so from an ER clinician or general clinician standpoint, um, it can be really, really hard to differentiate pulmonary hypertension from heart failure. Um, it's easier for me because I can echo. And so as soon as I put that echo on, I'm either going to see the left side of the heart abnormal, which is um, your typical heart disease, or the right side of the heart abnormal which is pulmonary hypertension, but not having that ability to do that um, in other in non-cardiologist clinics um, can make it really hard to differentiate the two. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, let's see here. So um, what are some of the first signs to be concerned about with heart disease? Activity level, yeah. cough, yeah. Thank you. yeah. So especially in the little dogs, um, coughing is typically going to be your first sign of heart disease and not just like a cough here and there, but a progressive cough. Um, and typically too, it's going to be a cough at nighttime because when the um, dog is laying down, the fluid starts to accumulate. So nighttime coughing, um, differentiating that from respiratory disease. So respiratory disease is usually a cough that is chronic. So um, heart failure, I expect weeks to months versus respiratory disease. They've been coughing for months to years. Um, coughing with activity is typically going to be respiratory disease versus, again, coughing while sleeping is usually heart failure. And then respiratory disease tends to have a, um, it's called a terminal retch, where they kind of cough and gag at the end. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit more consistent with respiratory disease um, than your non-productive coughing that we see with heart failure. So that cough is going to be one of the first signs. And then those sleeping respiratory rates starting to go up. Um, sometimes those can precede coughing as well. Um, and so Generally, those are going to be the number, the top signs. Um, exercise, like kind of slowing down gradually, um, lethargy, nonspecific signs typically are not due to heart um, disease, but sometimes certainly a really stoic dog, um, you know, may actually be having, you know, heart failure and just not, not, you know, breathing as hard or slowing down. Um, but usually when it's a little more nonspecific, it's not due to the heart. Um, this is a question about um, vet med in. So um, Lorraine's dog has some stomach and uh, stomach upset and diarrhea from it. So um, I think she asked about does giving it to giving it to him and his food decrease meds effectiveness versus giving it one hour before. 
And do you have any suggestions around the Pimo bending? Because I do see that sometimes too. Yeah. yeah so um, the package insert does say to feed it on an empty stomach. Um, I will say that I clinically don't see a difference between dogs that get it with food versus not. I think, and I could be wrong with this, but I think the reason why it says that on the package insert is that's how they tested the pharmacokinetics of it. And so they have to kind of put that on the package insert. But I've never had a dog where it was like, oh, we can't control the heart failure at all. But now that we're feeding it on an empty stomach, they're doing okay. So that should be fine. Um, and then, yes, the other really big question is Pimobendin, which is the generic form of, of Vetmedin versus Vetmedin brand. Um, so in general, I strongly recommend doing brand name for severe disease or heart disease or um, heart failure, primarily because there it is a little bit more effective. Um, and I actually did a couple studies on using um, Vetmedin versus Pimobendin. And I definitely had dogs that decompensated on the Pimobendin. So like their heart failure was controlled, they were doing fine, we switched to the compounded form, um, and they and they just didn't do as well. Um, for their mild and moderate heart disease, it is very, um, it's much more cost effective to do the compounded. So certainly um, for those cases, I think that's reasonable. Where it gets hard though, is if the heart disease continues to progress is knowing, is it progressing because the, the Pima Bend isn't effective enough or is the heart disease progressing that quickly? So, um, so in general, yeah, I think fine for mild disease, but more severe disease, I do strongly recommend at least starting with the brand name. Um, so for a dog that's already on medications, um, so say Pimobendin and Sildenafil, she said, um, does our dosages increased or the drugs added based on echocardio, um, echo results? So oh yeah, so that's a, yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. So, so sildenafil is one of the medications we use for pulmonary hypertension. Um, so that's that increased pressure in the lungs. So really, the only diagnostic that we use in veterinary medicine is echo to assess the pressure in the lungs. In people, they'll do heart caths and all kinds of other testing, but in in um, veterinary, the echo is our primary diagnostic tool. Um, so we certainly will increase up the sildenafil dosing based on um, echo, and then in terms of the um, Vetmedin or Pimobendin dosing, I generally will either adjust that dosing based on recurrence of heart failure. Um, I also do use in-house BNPs quite a lot. So um, that's that blood test that I talked about, where if that number is creeping up, even if the dog is clinically doing well, I've started ramping up my therapies, primarily because um, there's a lot of studies showing now that if that BNP increases by 20%, it's essentially predicting the onset of heart failure. So um, I will be a little bit more aggressive with those cases too. Um, and then then in terms of all the other types of medications like um, enalapril and benazapril and diuretic, those are actually going to be medications we're using when the patient has heart failure. So that's going to be more related to heart failure management and not so much echo. So sleeping respiratory rates, presence of clinical signs, presence of fluid on the lungs, um, increases in BNP rather than what the echo is actually showing. Right. It's like it's a multitude of things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is great. Angela Norris, uh, she said, she just adopted a 14 year old chi mix. Yay. Mm. Um, has heart problems and is currently taking vet med and twice a day. What are some low key exercises I can do with her to not overexert her heart? Yeah. So it really depends, honestly, on how um, severe the heart disease is. So I will actually honestly see quite a lot of adopted older dogs that don't even need to be on vet med in. So it's like a scenario of they were in the rescue, um, you know, the murmur was loud and just trying to do the best with what resources you have. And then I'll echo them and their hearts are pretty normal looking. And so if and those would be scenarios where the heart's functioning normally, even if you have a murmur, it doesn't mean that you can't do normal activity. Um, and for the vast majority of dogs, normal activity um, that they tolerate is just fine. Um, and then for dogs that we have known severe disease, that's where we need to be a little more careful. Like when I used to practice in Boulder, everybody hikes up Sanitas and like does 14ers. And there definitely are sometimes dogs that are so motivated to stay up with their, stay up with their owners that they're pushing themselves past where they should and then they can precipitate heart failure. But for your mild dogs, for sure, mo most moderate dogs, any activity is fine. Um, and then other more severe dogs kind of avoiding really explosive or really strenuous activity. Um, and then for things that, um, you know, we're trying to kind of keep our dogs uh, stimulated, long, slow walks are going to be really good for them where we're keeping that heart rate nice and low. Um, so, you know, increasing the 
length, but decreasing the intensity. Um, let's see here. Do you have time for a few more? I think we have sure. some good yeah. ones left too. Let's see. So does long-term steroid use, um, impact heart health or, um, specific heart diseases? Oh yeah. So that's a really good that's question too. Um, so the concern with steroids is that, um, especially in cats, it can, um, interact with the, um, basically volume retention. So it can actually make a heart become overloaded. Um, in general, this is not an issue we see with dogs. Um, potentially it could be of concern for a dog that's like on the brink of heart failure if they start steroids suddenly. Um, but otherwise for like a dog that's chronically on steroids, it doesn't have heart disease. It's certainly not going to cause heart disease. Um, and then steroids, I'm a, a lot more cautious with cats because um, that can actually trigger heart disease with them. Um, but otherwise in dogs, usually you're going to be okay. That's, that's a great one because I get that a lot too. Mm -hmm. So um, any other dietary recommendations with heart disease, things to include or avoid? Oh, that's a really good question, actually. So I, um, so I really like using um, cardiac diets for dogs with moderate or severe disease. Um, uh, there's two that are out there um, that I'm aware of. There's the Royal Canin. Um, it's called early cardiac, and I'm not really sure why, because I mean, with really early heart disease, I don't think there's much benefit, but certainly when you have a big heart, you have volume overload. Um, those diets are a little bit restricted in sodium, um, and so they get less fluid retention. Um, and then they're high in protein. So when you have a heart that's working overload, um, it's providing more energy to the heart. And then it's also providing omega-3 fatty acids, which are the primary energy source of the heart. Um, and so the Royal Canin Cardiac Diet and the Hills, um, I think it's HF or something like that, is, is one of the two diets I'm familiar with. Um, otherwise, if you're looking at kind of overall diet, um, you want something that's decent in protein. You don't have to do high protein, but you just don't want protein restricted. Um, kind of the opposite for sodium, where it's not high in sodium. Um, the only times I've really seen high sodium diets are if it's like a like a, a urinary tract issue. And so then we become, um, you know, trying to balance the high sodium where it's stimulating the dogs to drink more to flush out the bladder versus is it straining the heart. But then at the same time, if we have severe heart disease, we also don't want to develop stones and have to have surgery. So um, that's something to keep an eye on. And then omega-3 fatty acids, um, you can get those at your local store. Um, and those are the energy source for the heart. So especially dilated cardiomyopathy cases, um, but certainly um, they can be useful in um, moderate to severe heart disease as well, um, both by providing energy to the heart. And then also as the dogs get more severe disease, they tend to lose muscle mass and weight and the omegas can actually help maintain that body weight as well. Great. Um, so Nicole did ask about a diet um, for heart as well as kidney issues, but I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, when you have a dog with heart and kidney issues, yeah. because those are not, not always fun, fun yeah. kiddos to manage. Yeah. And so I have a pretty high threshold for abnormal kidney values for my heart failure patients. So in general, I will kind of ignore um, kidney changes with like diuretic therapy and whatnot. Um, things that I can remove are I can remove the ACE inhibitors. So um, the benazoprol and enalapril can sometimes shoot up those kidney values. So those are things I can remove. And then also if those kidney values are decreasing appetite, sometimes that additional ACE inhibitor can impact them. Um, other things I can do is I can um, increase up vet medin dosing to kind of um, balance using diuretics and um, and then also sometimes you can treat like high blood pressure or like even just like relatively high blood pressure um, to mitigate using diuretics as well. And then in terms of diet, um, probably you would want to go more with focusing on the kidneys and the kidney specific diet um, than the heart specific diet, um, just because we're more trying to prevent overload to the kidneys. And in general, kidney specific diets are not going to be bad for the heart. It's more those urinary diets that are the, the high sodium flushing out the, the, the bladder. That's great. Yeah, those two, those two things together sometimes, those two conditions get us um, so, uh, when you talk about general anesthesia, pushing the dog into heart failure, um, is that only to a reference for dogs with valve disease or do dogs with ARVC have the same risk? Oh yeah. That's so, um, yeah, that's a really good one too. <laughs> too. So 
The three things I worry about with anesthesia are overloading the heart, um, so fluid, um, dysfunction of the heart, and then over and not getting enough perfusion to the other body organs, um, and then arrhythmia. So um, ARVC in our Dobermans, we can see what's called ventricular tachycardia. Um, and then very frequently, we can see anesthesia kind of bringing out worsening arrhythmia as well. Um, and so their risks actually... In, as long as they so as long as they are having an anesthetic protocol that isn't using proarrhythmic medications and we're prepared ahead of time so we can use the medications like lidocaine to get the arrhythmia under control um having a life-threatening arrhythmia under anesthesia is relatively less likely as long as, again, you have all of that pre-planning. Um, and then the other cases are, again, making sure that the heart is getting enough perfusion to the kidneys and the important organs, um, and then we're not overloading the heart. Um, question about um, human heart disease and dog heart disease and what like if uh, humans are prone to this mitral valve disease or what is the most common thing we see in humans versus, versus dogs? Oh, yeah. So um, humans do get mitral regurgitation. Um, the threshold for intervention is significantly um, lower in people. So once you have like mild changes to your heart, they actually will do valve repair surgeries um, pretty quickly. So seeing severe mitral regurgitation and heart failure in people is less common. Certainly it can happen. Um, a lot of human heart disease is more functional. So um, they'll tend to get dysfunction of the heart. Um, and then they also get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy like cats. Oh, fun, huh? <laughs> um, and then question about using sedatives with um, some of the heart medications. Mm -hmm. Are those safe, um, such as like trazodone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a really good question. So I get asked a lot, like, is it safe to give these medications um, with heart medications? So general rule of thumb is actually the only medications that interact with heart medications are other heart medications. So for the most part, um, it's safe to give um, any of the heart medications with sedatives or um, anti-anxiety medication or heart guard or those things. Um, the places where we get a little bit more worried about sedation, um, so not necessarily anesthesia, but sedating are those pets that are like right on the brink of going into heart failure because then we can see them have decompensation. And then also dogs with abnormal heart rhythms, um, sedation can sometimes make that worse too. Great one. Um, and I think we had some other questions about food. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll answer or I'll ask them. Let's see here. So someone asked about her dogs on special skin, um, allergy diet, mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of pea protein and any suggestions for that? Um, because her dog also has some congestive heart failure going on too. Yeah, so the pea proteins more and more seem to be what the um, primary um, culprit of dysfunction is. So I, in general, would go to um, a prescription diet. So um, my dog is on um, Royal Cane and Whitefish and Potato. And so um, they so far have not any of the prescription um, diets that are limited ingredient have not had any cases of um, of dilated cardiomyopathy. So Royal Canin's diets, um, those those are the ones I generally are my go to. Um, have not had any described signs. So I would recommend swapping to one of those. And then um, the nice part about some of the fish diets is they're also high in omega fatty acids. So you kind of get that that double whammy there. Unfortunately, the cardiac diet is chicken based, so does not work well for dogs that have chicken allergies. Right. And then last question, homemade food um, versus store bought um, for, for dogs with cardiac yeah. disease. Any thoughts yeah. on that? And that's a um, that's a good question. So I do think that if you do go the the homemade food route, you want to work with an, uh, a nutritionist or make sure you're using a balanced plan, because um, certainly we've seen dysfunction in the hearts from um, home cooked diets. And then um, what I usually tell people too is like, I mean, especially the heart failure dogs, their appetites do go down a bit. So there's nothing wrong with mixing as well. So you can always do like some cardiac diet and then put like cooked diet as well um, and just kind of do a mixture because a nice part about the commercially prepared diets is it has all of the nutrient needs in one place. So you don't really have to worry about it. Um, so as long as they're getting some of a um, structured food, um, even if you're kind of doing 50-50, your dog should be getting the nutrients that they need. Great. 
I think one one other question that just came up, um, what are some other low cost options to determine the severity of heart disease other than an echo? Oh yeah, so BMP is gonna be your best on. one, yeah. So BMP, um, if your clinic doesn't have BMP, x-rays are also, um, also helpful. And then really it's also taking the breed into account. Um, so your small dogs, again, if that murmur is getting louder every year, um, you know, if it's a two and then three years later, it's a five, I'm significantly more worried about that. Um, and then for your large breed dogs that can get either of those heart diseases, that's where it gets a lot more tricky. So small dogs in general, if it's a grade one or two murmur, we're suspecting it's mitral regurgitation. That's usually going to be mild disease. And then a grade three murmur or louder, I generally recommend an echo. Bigger dogs though can get dilated cardiomyopathy and the murmur actually gets softer as the disease gets worse. So that's going to be a little bit harder to differentiate. That's great. Yeah, I think you've echoed three of my dogs upon yeah. someone yeah. hearing a, a really low grade murmur and me immediately rushing to you. Wonderful. Great to have those. <laughs> uh, uh, perfect. I think we have answered most all questions. These were all wonderful, wonderful questions. And uh, hopefully you have taken some of this uh, information um, back to your homes and to your vets and to your animals. And Dr. Lake Bacar, I'll let you do the send off in case there's anything you wanna close on or anything you wanna add, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, and certainly anyone that's in the Colorado area. Um, you know, we love to see people, um, especially if you have some of your younger dogs, because we do have a blood donor program. Um, and so if you have any interest in that, you can call that main number or you can go onto our website and click on blood bank. Um, also, I do have a lot of um, client educational handouts. So if you go to our website, you can go to client education. I have handouts on my regurgitation, heart failure, um, dietary associated associated cardiomyopathy. And so that's a nice resource for people as well, um, both for clients and for veterinarians that has all the information on there that I think is pertinent because, you know, if you start going down the Dr. Google route, it can get very stressful. So um, I try to have all the information that you need right there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, again. And I hope everybody has a good rest of your day. And yes, we will send the, I think this link goes on the website. Um, but, uh, we'll definitely have this, um, out for you guys. So you can go back and, and rewatch too. So thanks again, Dr. Lake Bakar. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Take care.